For context, I grew up in the suburbs, and apart from the occasional play park or sports field, there was nothing to do. My neighbors and I used to play knock and run, also known as ding dong ditch. To provide context, I have a sister who was a year younger than me, and my neighbor James was the same age as me. His older sister was 14 at the time, and she occasionally played with us, although I think she just wanted to hang out with my sister, whom she thought was cute. Admittedly, I was the biggest coward in the group, and to this day, my flight instinct is still stronger than my fight instinct. I would never ring the doorbell, as I would always find a way to avoid it. I found watching it much more entertaining than actually doing it. On this particular afternoon, my cousins came over. One of my cousins was my age, the other a few years younger than me, and unable to play with us, and the third was a year older than me. Everyone treated them like an adult, even though he was only 11. Let's call this cousin Daniel, as he is somewhat important to the story. I am not really a reliable narrator, as it has been almost 10 years since these events, but I will try my hardest to remember them. And either way, I'm kind of getting off topic, but my cousins came over, and we were banished outside to play. We all decided that knock and run was a good idea. We usually just play around our immediate street, never venturing further than the next street over out of fear of getting lost in the copied and pasted suburban streets. We made our way up to the street to the play park on the top of the hill. It sat where a house could have been and someone could cut across it on the next road. As we sat in the play equipment, we decided that a vote should decide who knocked first and, of course, I was picked. I remember getting myself out of it and getting my older cousin to take my place. I'm thankful that he was as proud as he was. It helped me get out of a lot of situations. We decided that our first target would be the fanciest looking house in the area, a white marble house with a fountain in the front yard and a curved driveway. I remember sitting next to a car. I was small enough to look under it from the curb and I had a clear view of my cousin sneaking up to the door and ringing the doorbell three times to get the attention of whoever was inside. Then he bolted down the pathway towards the street to hide behind the cars. Before he got to the fence, an older man in a black leather apron with what I assumed was paint on it came sprinting after him. I immediately knew something was wrong. This wasn't the usual response to a knock and run. Sure, we had encountered some angry people before, but this was something very different. We practically flew down the walkway towards Daniel and threw his hand out to grab him. This didn't feel like something someone his age could do, and it scared me. I think I might have been the only one with a clear view of what was going on, which meant that I was the first to see what was happening. It wasn't until the man was practically on top of Daniel that he noticed he was being chased, and the scream that he made when he realized this will always stick with me. As I mentioned at the start of this, Daniel was, and still is, a very proud person who will always try to prove himself, so hearing this scream of pure terror struck me to my core. Everyone was clued in at this point as to what was happening. Daniel didn't open the waist-high gate at the end of the path, he just jumped it, which I think ultimately saved him from getting hurt as the old man had to take a second to open it. Daniel was sprinting down the street as fast as I had ever seen him. Stop, the man yelled with a deep, angry voice. This actually stopped Daniel in his tracks. They were both standing in the middle of the road at this point, reminding me of an old western movie when two cowboys would be standing at either end of the main road. The man marched straight up to Daniel's face, and I could finally get a good look at him. His skin resembled rough leather, and the few strands of hair on his head had long since grayed. He was clean shaven and wearing white pants, a white button up shirt and a black leather apron with what I rationalized as red paint on it. After he was maybe half a foot from Daniel, he started to berate him and I could only make out the words sick people in there. Everything about this man threw me off and I could see my neighbor and my other cousin who was hiding in the bushes feeling the same. My neighbor's older sister, whom I'll call Tay, screamed at him from the other side of the road, which gave Daniel the opportunity to run as fast as he could away from the man. We all ran at that point. I don't think I or anyone else knew where we were running off to, but I found myself in the car park of the shopping center across the road from me. I waited there for maybe 30 minutes, just watching cars come in and out, feeling safer with a large group of people. I had no idea at the time if he chased one of us, but... 
I knew that I was safe. I made my way back to my house and found that I was the last one to return. My cousin Daniel ran straight home and Tay followed him. My other cousin and neighbor ran around the suburbs for a bit before deciding to go home. My mom was missing when I got home and I realized that she had been told what happened. My mother is someone who isn't afraid of protecting her own and she is one of the strongest people I know, so I felt pretty safe that she was aware and was off telling him to buzz off. But when she got back, she seemed off. She didn't want to talk about it or anything and any color from her face had completely drained. We slept at my neighbor's house that night because my mom wanted to talk to my dad about something serious and I think we all knew what it was about. Nothing happened for a while after that. Mum was a lot more protective of what we did outside. We were no longer allowed to play knock and run or go up to the road without a parent. It really bugged my sister who loved to play outside, but I don't think she fully understood what happened. I have a lot more stories about this guy and I'll probably write more because this helped me get a better grip on everything that happened throughout that year, but I hope you enjoy the very first event in one of the worst periods of my life. Before I get into the next few events, I think it's important to address some things that I've read in the last post. I know that we were the ones who originally disturbed him, but I thought it was important to dedicate a post to that event as it kind of kicked off a lot of stuff. I will probably update this post with a few more stories just to get it all out there, but I just want to say that I fully understand my and everyone else's part that we played in part one. However, I believe the issue really began after that, which is what I'll show you today. Now first things first, I promised a few of you that I would ask my mom what the old man had told her last night at dinner and I did manage to do so. She was surprised that I remembered what happened and tried to sweep it under the rug, but I kept pressing her for answers. I'm not proud of pressuring my mother into talking to me about something like this, but curiosity got the better of me, and I know that isn't an excuse, but I feel it somewhat justifies my actions, as a lot of you wanted to know as well. After I pressed her for more answers, she grabbed my arm and led me to my room before placing me on my bed. She sat next to me and told me not to repeat anything of what I said to my sister, my cousins, or anyone else who was involved with this man throughout that year. She finally opened up about how she was sitting at home watching TV when she heard a loud knock on the front door. It was my cousin Daniel and my neighbor Tay who looked terrified and exhausted. After letting them in and grilling them for answers, my mom was rightfully angry that someone had spoken to them in such a way. So she got up to go and confront the man and on her way out, my other cousin and neighbor arrived whom she also sent inside. She was concerned about where I was but Daniel made it clear that I had ran in the opposite direction of the man and that he would go out looking for me, which he didn't. My mom made her way to the play park and saw the man pacing back and forth up and down his driveway. He didn't seem angry or upset. He apparently didn't seem like anything besides someone marching back and forth, which took my mother's mood from enraged to kind of confused. She walked up to the front gate and let herself in, which made the man stop almost immediately and stare at her. I am surprised that she didn't turn back and go home at that point because that's what I and what I imagined anyone would have done, but as I said in part one, I'm a coward. The man marched up to my mom and started to berate her about trespassing on her property, which she met by berating him about terrifying some kids. This apparently went on for a couple of minutes before he said something that terrified her. My mom didn't say exactly what he said because she said that she was trying to forget it, but he said something along the lines of, I'll show both of you what it feels like to have somebody on your property when you don't want them there, and then I'll shut those kids up forever. He tries to grab her at that point, but she quickly moved away and left his yard, swiftly walking back home. This really affected my mom, but that was the answer I got from her. I gave her a hug and apologized for pressing her to tell me and we got back to dinner shortly after. I don't regret her telling me, but it just feels like knowing the end of a movie and seeing all of the hints leading up to it, recontextualizing a lot of stuff. It had been about a month, maybe a month and a half since the first initial incident with the man. We hadn't seen him since and I was forgetting about it until I went to the shops one day. Now, for further context, my parents had started to let me go to the shops by myself to grab little things for them. I was young at the time, and the shops were across the road from me, so getting there wasn't an issue. 
One day, my dad asked me to go and grab a loaf of bread for him. He gave me two $2 coins and sent me on my way to the shops. I was getting used to doing this on my own, enjoying my independence. I grabbed the bread, which was on the far side of the large supermarket, and made my way towards the registers. I stopped by the toy aisle and took a look at all of the low-quality, mass-produced action figures that I desperately wanted. This was part of my routine. Even now, if I wanted something, but didn't have the money to get it, I would just look at it. But on this occasion, I wish I had just continued to the registers. I felt two hands push me to the ground from my left. I was shocked for a moment as I didn't fully know what had just happened. The sticky and dusty floor beneath me hurt. It took me a second to look at my attacker and when I did, I immediately knew that this was very wrong. It was the old man from up the road. He had found me in the place that I had hid from him just a month prior. He started to shout at me, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. I don't know if it was the adrenaline ringing in my ears or his rage just taking over, but the tone in which he was shouting shook me. I tried to get up to run, but when I planted my foot in the ground to get up, he kicked it out from below me, which made me fall back to the ground. Thank God a staff member arrived at this point. They must have heard his shouting from across the store and came to check on what was happening. I didn't get a good look at the staff member, but I am thankful for them. As I got up to run with the loaf of bread in my hand, I could hear the man reacting to me getting away, and it took everything in me not to look behind me to look at him, but I knew that he was furious. I ran straight out of the store with the bread without realizing it and almost threw up from all of the emotions that I was feeling. I told my parents when I got home, and they both made it clear that I wouldn't be going on any shopping trips by myself from here on out. They didn't think about how me and my sister walked together to school, which in hindsight should have been something that they thought of. The trip to my school wasn't a long one. It was just over a kilometer long, or just over half a mile, but the trip was still tough on small legs. There were quite a few hills, which added time to our trip there, and the path went along a creek with nothing around it. It was nice and isolated, which helped relax my mind after school. Not long after the supermarket incident, my sister and I were walking home from school. We had just reached the beginning of the path along the creek when we spotted an SUV that appeared to have been parked there for quite some time. I initially assumed it was empty, but as you can probably guess, it wasn't. We were about to enter the creek when suddenly, the car door of the SUV opened and we heard someone shouting at us. Hey, you guys want to ride home? It was the man from the supermarket. My sister, who was always trusting of others, began walking towards the truck, but I quickly held her back. What's wrong? The man asked in a cheerful tone. This was a stark contrast to the unintelligible screaming we had experienced just a week earlier, and I wanted nothing to do with this man. I quickly started to lead my sister towards the creek, and the man quickly scooted over towards the door. Wait up, I'll, I'll walk you home. I should have headed up the hills towards the school, but instead I started sprinting down the creek. In hindsight, I feel foolish. If you remember, Daniel ran away from him and the man quickly caught up to him, and Daniel's faster than me, but for some reason, he didn't leave his truck. All I heard was another unintelligible scream followed by his truck driving away. My sister was furious as we ran that we didn't get a ride home. And as we slowed down, she was frustrated that we had to walk, but I didn't care. She and I were safe, so we continued walking along the path. Looking back, the path was beautiful and connected to small, quiet streets on either side, the perfect balance between isolation and convenience. And regrettably, my young mind failed to realize that the creek led to two quiet streets. When I spotted that same silver SUV at the end of the path, I froze. I felt powerless and had to protect my sister who was now starting to doubt the man's intentions. I decided the best course of action was to cross the creek and make our way through the bushes to the other side. It was an extremely risky move considering the slippery rocks, wildlife and running water but somehow we managed. I climbed over logs, under tree branches, through prickly bushes and large plants, eventually reaching another road that led us home. It's possible that those two SUVs were different, but at the time, I was certain that they were the same. Even now, I'm not 100% sure if they were different. 
My parents eventually got the police involved, but based on the subsequent events, it seems that that may not have done much. Other incidents occurred during this time, such as mail theft, knockover bins, and late night door knocking, which we suspected he was doing, though we lacked concrete proof. The last incident I want to mention occurred during a camp out with my dad. We'd sleep on the couches in the living room, right next to the front door, and watch movies with pizza or takeout. One night, everyone else had gone to sleep, and I was watching Naruto on TV, even though I hadn't seen it before. I was sitting by the large window overlooking the driveway when I noticed movement outside. I looked out and saw him, the man, walking up to our front door, wearing his white pants and a white button-up shirt. He was fixated on our front door with unwavering focus and it felt as though nothing could divert his attention. But something did. He saw me. He looked directly at me and I could see in his eyes that he found it amusing. He raised his hand, waved at me and then placed a finger to his lips as if instructing me to keep quiet. Then he jogged away. Strangely, I fell asleep not long after that and for the longest time I thought it was just a dream. It was only after reading all of Naruto and recognizing the scene that I began to question whether it had actually been a dream. Given what my mom had told me, I think I have an idea of what he might have been attempting. So, it was summer, and the local council decided to have a fair. The local council hired a few clowns, some face painting stations, food trucks, and bouncy castles at the local football field. Of course, me and my sister were beyond excited to go. For a young child, this was the hottest ticket in town, and my parents were happy to take us, as it was just down the road and free. I remember the field being beyond busy. The crowd was difficult to walk in and even harder to see through, but we managed to find ourselves right next to a giant blow-up bouncy slide. As it was summer, the actual balloon on the slide burned to the touch, and the sun made me feel like I was slowly melting. Regardless of this, I must have spent at least 40 minutes going up and down that slide. I was having too much fun and didn't notice that both my parents and sister had gone missing in the giant crowd of people. I got down from the slide, put my shoes and socks back on and started to make my way through the crowd. I didn't actually know where I was going and I remember feeling incredibly anxious as I waddled around the fair. It wasn't until I felt a hand on my shoulder and then on my forearm that I felt a little safer. It was my dad, I thought. He had found me. I couldn't actually tell whose arm it was as the angle at which it was holding my arm made it difficult to look at it in the crowd. The whole day was overwhelmingly stimulating and I wasn't thinking clearly. I should have known from how hard the hand was gripping me or the fact that it was leading me to the parking lot that something was wrong. I only really felt terror when I saw my parents running towards me, running faster than I had ever seen them run. Adrenaline immediately coursed through my veins and I pivoted my body around and immediately saw the leathery hand on my arm in white pants. The link was connected in my mind as to who this was. My mother's scream was the first thing I heard and the angrier annoyed grunt of the old man followed it. He started to jog with me towards his truck but I had started to fight back against his grip. He may have been old, but he was stronger than any elderly person should be, and he was faster too. Everything about this man was wrong, and it may have been my young mind making it all up, but I still believed that something was very weird about him. No elderly person should be like this. At this point, I was only a couple of feet away from his car, and as he opened the door, I felt two hands on my right arm that pulled me hard against the man's grip. The man's grip held on before my dad came out from behind me and slammed the old man's head into his car, which loosened his grip on me. At this point, my mother grabbed me and ran, and we went straight home. Apparently, they didn't notice me slip away on the bouncy slide, and they ran into some family friends who offered to take care of my sister while they searched for me. I don't know what type of person it takes to do something like that in such a populated area, but this man was not normal, not in the slightest. My dad returned later that night. He looked really roughed up and drained of all energy. From what I gathered over the years, they got into a pretty brutal fight that ended with the police breaking it up. My dad didn't get into that much trouble considering that he had called the police on the man before, but they still took him to the station to give a statement. When he sat down on the couch, he looked exhausted, 
bruises forming all over and a cut on his lip and upper eyebrow still leaking blood, but he had a smile on his face and I could hear him telling my mom that it was over. They were both hopeful and so was I. A couple of weeks later, my cousins came back over and Daniel wanted to know everything. He felt like he was the main victim and deserved to know everything because he was the one that the man shouted at and the one that the man wanted to get the most. I don't disagree that the man would probably try to hurt him on sight, but it felt weird to me, almost like he was trying to take credit for something that, to him, sounded like a creepy story, but to my family, was very real. Anyway, we decided to go out for a bit. My parents trusted us because we were with my older cousin. We went up to the usual play park, which was across the street from the man's currently vacant house. Daniel was telling us about how he swore that he saw him near his house. Keep in mind that he lives almost three hours away. I'm not saying that he's a liar, but I am saying that he wanted to be a part of this. Anyways, we were playing hide and seek. Tay, our neighbor, was seeking, and she only just started to count down from 60. I always tagged along with Daniel because he always found the best spots. We ran across the road towards the man's house, and Daniel jumped the fence, which I immediately stopped at. Come on, he said from the other side of the waist-high fence. No one's going to find us. The house felt like a void that we could get sucked into, and I had up until that point refused to even be near it, but for some reason I agreed. I joined him in the man's yard, and to my shock, Daniel wanted to go deeper into his home, not just his yard. I made it clear that this was a very bad idea, even if he was in custody or jail or wherever he was, we would be breaking into someone's home. Daniel didn't seem scared by it though. I think the whole idea of being in the man's house seemed too attractive to him. We went around the side of the fence to his backyard and it was overgrown, almost like no one had been living there for years. I made my way towards his back window looking inside. From what I could make out, he was a hardcore minimalist, only having a TV, chair, fireplace, and shelf that housed some photos of a much younger man and some medals. He was a veteran, and that really changes nothing to me, but it explains his above average speed and strength, and especially for his age. The sound of a door sliding open almost made me yell in fear. Daniel had found an unlocking sliding door and wanted to venture inward. I ran around to find him, but he was already inside before I could stop him. At this point, I was also curious to find out more, but I understood the risk of the saw. It didn't matter if I understood it because I went in with him. The rest of the house reflected the living room, the kitchen had a fridge and stove, and the dining room only had a small table with one wooden chair. There was no decoration on the walls or signs of life besides these sad reminders of how lonely the man had been. As I said, this changes nothing for me. I hate this man more than anyone can ever know. We made our way upstairs and found two completely empty rooms in one bedroom. A single bed with a bedside table filled with different types of weapons. A hatchet, a knife, and a knuckle duster. I had never seen a knuckle duster before and I successfully fought the urge to take it and put it on. This was something that Daniel failed to do as he almost immediately grabbed it, which I almost hit him for. We continued searching the house and Daniel had the idea that he must have something weird in his wardrobe. When we opened it, he gave a disappointed sigh as there was nothing inside except a few white button-ups and white pants. This especially creeped me out as he never wore anything else. We made our way back down the stairs and into the living room and to our surprise, we missed the table that sat next to the couch. It was just out of view and only had one drawer. Daniel opened it and struggled to get it out fast, but when he did, he found something profoundly strange. It was a single photo. Neither of us could make out what it was, but we knew that it looked familiar. Daniel sat down in the chair, bored, and it was only then that we heard Tay scream out that she had given up. Daniel shot up and sprinted back to the backyard. We had both completely forgotten about her, but as I put the photo back into the drawer... Something stood out to me about the photo. The fence was navy blue. This was something unusual in my area, and I knew of only one navy blue fence in the suburb, our side door entrance fence. The realization made the photo seem so much clearer. The white pebbles on the ground leading to the backyard, the cream color of the garage next to it, and the green bush at the end of the path. This was my home. 
I get a photo of my house. I quickly met back up with Daniel and Tay and we went back home. I should have told my parents, but I was scared that I would be in trouble if they found out that we were inside of his home. I understood why we would be, but I still didn't want to live up to it. About a month after that, we were having another camp out with me, my dad, and my sister. Both my sister and dad had fallen asleep with the TV still on, illuminating the room. It was one of those weird situations where we were both really comfortable and really uncomfortable. This was my situation, and on most nights I loved this feeling, but that feeling will always be tied to this night. I was drifting off to sleep as well, but I heard the sliding back door open slowly. I peered up above the couch and saw the silhouette of a man standing in the doorway. I froze with fear and started to cry. My dad woke up at this point and I am not entirely sure how, maybe it was a parental instinct, but he knew almost immediately that something was wrong. He got off the bed and crouched toward the dining room, which is where the back door was. The other man had begun to walk slowly through the house at this point, murmuring to himself. To my horror, I recognized the pants, the bright white pants. So many questions went through my mind, the most prevalent one being how he was in custody, but none of that mattered because there he was, standing in my dining room, holding something. My dad charged him from around the corner and tackled him into the wall. The old man punched him in the arm and my dad immediately dropped that arm. It was the knuckle duster that Daniel was wearing. It was at this point that the lights turned on. I don't know if it was my dad or the man, but they came on and the man made a noise of pure horror. Both men were fully healed from their last fight, but my dad took a real beating. I had always expected that the old man would have his butt kicked, but now I'm not so sure. My dad was standing in the doorway to the living room, shielding us with his body. My sister was awake and crying at this time, as was I, and my mom also ran down the stairs and immediately saw everything that was going on. The man had lunged at my dad with a thing in his hand that I could see was a hatchet. My dad threw himself to the side, and my other arm got scraped by the hatchet, drawing blood. My mom at this point leapt toward the old man and pushed him into the kitchen bench, which made him scream but he was up almost as fast as he was down. He slashed at my mom and missed her, and my dad ran to the other room and started to call the police. My mom was dodging his slashes while also throwing things at him. When she got to the knife block, she armed herself with two knives and threw one of them, and the handle hit him in the face, knocking him back. My mom took the opportunity and drove the knife into his shoulder, which made him scream again. He fell to the ground and didn't try to get up until the police arrived. After this happened, we moved. Not too far away, maybe just half an hour away. Even though we lived so close to that place, we have never returned. And as much as I have been tempted to go back and relive some stuff, for the time being, I'm pretty comfortable staying here. Apparently, he paid bail and was staying in the hospital for a while before staying at somebody else's house. I know that he made his way back to his house before making his way home. It creeps me out to think that I could have been in his home at the same time as him. Well, it's been ten years and it's been something that's been buried into my mind for a while. I just want to thank all of you for hearing my story. So this all starts when me and my two buddies, me 19 and them 20 and 17, went to go fish off of this bank on the river in the afternoon. The layout is that you drive over to the levee before you drop down into a boat ramp slash parking area right next to the river. We brought pizza, beer, weed, music, and of course our rods hoping that we'd just hang out and do some late night fishing. At this point, we were all set up on the bank with our chairs and speaker having a nice evening and it's probably been two hours and it's 9pm now. All three of us were feeling good with some beers in our system and then we all of a sudden hear two cars with super loud music pull up and everyone gets out. The cars must have had four to five people in each one because I heard a lot of people talking but it was all in Spanish so I couldn't make anything out. We tried to ignore it but then it gets too loud that we couldn't enjoy ourselves so we started packing our stuff to head back to the car and just 
chill out while we sober up. While we were gathering our things, we start to hear what sounds like an argument go down. We start to hear lots of glass shattering and people screaming at the top of their lungs. They couldn't see us, but they were basically no more than 20 feet behind our heads. At this point, we're just keeping quiet and then start to hear what sounded like someone getting punched repeatedly and then a loud splash in the river by the boat ramp and someone saying, Nah, leave him, leave him, which was the only word spoken in English. At this point, we didn't know what we just heard and happened and we didn't want to stick around and find out. The three of us trekked back up the steep incline to get back to the car, but as soon as we came into their view, they all got back into the two cars and quickly sped back over the levee. Except we spotted one of the cars just sitting on the top of the levee slowly creeping forward. When we turned our car on, that car then went fully over the levee. We realized that we were the only car left in the parking lot and it was now pitch black outside at around 9.30pm. We sat there for no more than 30 seconds just trying to process what we had just heard go down, then we decided that we needed to go out of there completely and park somewhere to sober up all the way. As we were going over the levee, the road goes over it and then down and makes a sharp left. Right after we take that sharp left, our hearts drop when we see four cars lined up completely horizontal across the road, blocking us from getting through. There's orchards on the left and right, so there's no going around at all. At this point, my buddy just gassed it straight towards their bumpers to try and split it between the cars and get out of there, even if it meant damaging the front end of his car. Just as we do that, one of the four cars slightly moved out of the way, creating a gap. We flew right through it and just got out of there, and they were laying on their horn while we passed through. We don't know what their intentions were, but clearly there were two cars in the boat ramp area where we were at and two cars on the other side of the levee blocking the road from anyone else coming in. I ended up filing a police report just in case they really did dump a body into that river. It happens all the time here, but I haven't heard anything back and it's definitely one of my most terrifying experiences that I potentially had with some cartel. So when I was a kid, maybe six or seven, this was in the mid-90s, we took a family trip to the beach in Florida. We were staying in a beach house a short walking distance from the beach. We went to the beach and I was supposed to stay in sight of my mom, but I wandered way down and before I knew it, I was lost. A lot of the houses looked the same and I wasn't sure which one was ours, plus I couldn't see my mom anywhere. It started to rain. I came to a path that I was pretty sure led back to our house, only it didn't lead to a house at all, but instead to a parking lot. There was a big dirty van parked there, and it was the only vehicle around. I was about to turn back when I noticed an overweight woman with brown hair, a hot pink tank top, and those big clunky thick glasses that were popular in the 80s, waving and smiling at me from the passenger seat of the van. She said something like, Oh my, it's raining. Where's your mommy? Uh, let's take you to her. It's very dangerous for you to be out here in the rain. You could get struck by lightning. She was very friendly, almost overly so. In the driver's seat was a very overweight man without a shirt on, a hairy gray chest and some clunky looking gold chain. He was wearing yellow tinted elvish shades and staring at me intently. He was also smoking a cigarette which I knew was bad. The woman stepped out of the van and kneeled down to me. She asked how old I was. When I told her, she gleefully remarked, Oh my, we have two boys your age at our house. You should come over and spend the night. We've got movies, Nintendo, and in the morning, we've got all types of cereal. I had been taught all about stranger danger, but at this point in my life, no adult had ever given me any reason not to trust them. The lady continued talking about stuff like how the boys have go-karts and that they like to drink chocolate milk. She made it seem very enticing for a seven-year-old kid, and at this point, I trusted her. I mostly liked the idea of getting to play with some kids my age. Then I remembered that I needed to ask my mom first. I told her this. She told me that was no problem, that they just live up the road. My mom wouldn't mind. It started raining harder, and she opened the sliding door of the van and said something like, 
Now let's get you out of the rain and go find mommy, okay? I knew logically that I shouldn't do this, but the lady seemed really nice, and I was desperately wanting to get out of the rain. As I walked toward the open door of the van, I noticed an awful stench that almost made me gag. This set off alarm bells in my head that something wasn't right. There were cigarette butts all over the floor. I looked at the fat man who was not only staring at me with this sort of menacing glare, but he had this really creepy toothy smile and his teeth were stained a dark yellow. I could pick up a very messed up vibe from him. I knew now that I should run, but the woman was ushering me to hurry up and get in. Her demeanor changed. She was being demanding and trying to literally push me into the van. She sounded very angry and said, Get in already! In a tone that was the complete opposite of how she had sounded before. I jumped to the side and started running as fast as I could. The woman managed to grab my arm or wrist, but somehow I was able to quickly break free and run back to the beach. I think she tried to chase me, but like I said, she was very overweight. I made it back to my mom, who was freaking out. I tried explaining what had happened to me, but I don't think that at seven years old I was able to convey the gravity of what happened, and I didn't fully understand it myself. This story starts back in 2017, when my boyfriend and I started living together. Rent in our country has been really high for years, so after looking for a while, we decided to emigrate. Our college is very close to the border between our home country and the neighboring country, and in the neighboring country, the rents are way lower. After a few months, we found an apartment. It used to be the old hay attic of a farm, but a rich couple, the landlord, turned the attic into an apartment years ago and turned the rest of the house into a home for themselves. We loved the place and signed the rental agreement and moved in September of 2017. At first, all was great. We liked our landlord and his wife, even though they were a bit eccentric, but after a while things became less comfortable. The landlord would blast loud music at all hours of the night. If he asked him to fix something, he would show up at 2am. He constantly bragged about how he kicked out the precious tenants after they told him that the rent was too high. When rats infested our roof and ceiling and created holes that went straight outside, he used expanding foam to kill them, trapping the rats in the process which led to them dying and decomposing in the ceiling. And most importantly, he would knock on our door for minutes on end and if we didn't answer, he would stand underneath our window and yell our names like he knew that we were there but ignoring him. Once he even got into the apartment without permission. I got home and was sweaty as hell so I walked straight into the bathroom which was located on the left side of the entrance. When I came out wrapped in a towel and walked towards the living room, he suddenly came through the front door. I asked him what he was doing here and he told me that he left his key in our house after a visit, even though he used that key to get in. The last points finally clicked when we moved out. The landlord was about to move to Poland and the new landlord was a jerk so we decided to move out. We told him about it and he said, well, can you give back my camera then? We thought he was joking, but after he left we suddenly felt so weird about it, so we checked. The apartment had a very high pointed ceiling so we had to use a ladder but there on the high horizontal beam we found a small camera pointed at our living room. I think I still have the video somewhere of my boyfriend cutting the wire. All of a sudden the cam network that we saw on the Wi-Fi list on our phones was gone as well. We moved out and thought about pressing charges but this man had a great lawyer and was long gone by then. So I'm a new Uber Eats driver, only been going about a month. I was just completing an order in the middle part of town. Not too suburbs, but also not too iffy. I live in a major city, so going in and out of varying income level places is normal. As I walked up to my customers, I see there's a man and a woman in the doorway and another woman across from them on the sidewalk. The woman in the doorway is standing timidly behind the guy and his jaw looks firm. She doesn't break eye contact with me as I walk up, but I try not to pay it much mind. 
The guy accepted it and said thanks and rushed him and his girl into the building. I started to walk back to my car when I noticed the woman from before gently calling for me to stop. She was gently saying, hey, and I almost didn't catch it. However, I did notice her trying to keep pace with me on my way to my car. That sent my haunches up and I did a quick little one-two step to get a bit in front of her. I jumped into my car without breaking eye contact with her, quick pushed the lock button on my door, and she still proceeded to try and reach for my passenger side door as if to open it. She heard the door click and stopped on her way to grab it. She bent down to look at me through my window and her eyes looked far off and bleary. She kept mouthing something, but just like before, her voice was very quiet and I couldn't hear her. I cracked my window just a little bit so I could hear her, but not enough that she could get a hand inside. I said, Sup? I was pretending to be callous and hard, but I am very soft and easily intimidated. I'm not good with confrontation, and in most dangerous situations, I tend to panic. I'm really proud of myself at this point that I was quick enough to think of all of these safe solutions. She starts talking in circles about, what are you doing? Where are you going? You can't deliver for Uber, you're in high school, etc. Keep in mind that I do have a baby face, but I am 30 years old. I'm polite but curt with her and tell her, yes, I'm doing deliveries and now I have to go. Did you need something or did you need any help? She keeps trying to talk in circles, but as I'm about to insist that I'm leaving, she says, hey, let me come with you. I get this weird feeling in the back of my neck because she looks like what she said was a perfectly sane request and still did not break eye contact with me. Also, keep in mind that this entire time she's been speaking with a very gentle and quiet voice as if she was talking to a small, scared animal. I say, no thanks, and she insists saying, just trust me, I'm going to go with you, just trust me. Again, this point, getting more nervous, I say no thanks, I'm about to drive off, you should step back so I don't run over your feet. She tries to get a little closer, maybe thinking that if she doesn't move, I won't move. She sadly is mistaken, and I start rolling slowly forward saying you better step back, I'm about to crush your feet. She kept laughing to some unknown joke in her own mind saying you're so funny, you're so funny. I peeled out of there and confusedly look back in my rearview mirror. I never came across someone like that before, and I have been in much rougher neighborhoods than this, so I was very confused. I called my neighbor who used to live in that rougher part of my larger city, and said that she could have potentially been trying to trap me so that another person or car could roll up on my driver's side and potentially jump me or try to even steal the car. I'm always glad for this insight because of all my shelteredness, I have no idea about all of these strategies that people have to come up with to get you. I used to go to dance clubs and bars with my friends back when I was in college. This particular night, my friends and I were just standing at a cocktail table, drinking and just casually chatting. A group of guys went to us and started to chat. The guy that approached me was probably two or three years older than me and he seemed friendly. Back then, I entertained guys at bars, gave my numbers, but I don't trust them enough to go with them to their place or whatever. I don't easily get drunk to the point where I don't know what I'm doing, especially if I've only had one glass of alcohol, but for some reason, I got really drunk and dizzy from just one small glass. I don't remember what I was drinking. I don't know how I got into this situation, and that's the last thing I remember. I recall him pulling into a hotel that had a car garage. In my home country, there's a travel hotel where each room has its own car garage that you can simply pull into, and there are stairs by the garage leading to your room. You drive onto the property, then take your information and credit card, then give you the keys to the room and garage. I remember that it was just the two of us and he was helping me up the stairs because I was too dizzy to walk on my own. When we reached the room, he laid me down on the bed. I was wearing shorts and he was attempting to pull them down. Even though I was drunk, I was still somewhat aware of what was happening. I couldn't stand up and fight him because I was too dizzy and weak, but I remember screaming and telling him no. I was pulling my shorts up and trying to remove his hands and I don't know what happened but he suddenly stopped. 
He went to get a glass of water for me to drink, and then we went downstairs, him actually helping me. The next thing I knew, we were back at the club. We were in his car, and my friends were there assisting me because I was vomiting. He was also there trying to act concerned and patting my back. When I felt better, I got out of the car, and my friends and I sat down by the chairs outside the club, waiting for my parents to pick me up. I don't know where he went, but he wasn't there. I told my friends what I remembered happening. One of my friends, A, told me that she saw me leaving the club with the guy. I don't remember walking out of the club. I asked her why she didn't stop me because she knew that I wouldn't just leave without saying something. My friends also know that I don't easily get drunk, so they think that he put something in my drink. I never called the police since I don't have any proof either. I do know that nothing happened, that he didn't do what he was planning to do because I remember it clearly, still being somewhat aware of what was happening. I don't know if his conscience urged him not to do it or if it was because he was stupid enough to bring me to a hotel, leaving his information or maybe it was because I screamed. He was somewhat kind enough to bring me back to the bar instead of taking me somewhere else or harming me further, so maybe his conscience urged him. The last thing that happened is when my parents picked me up, I saw him by the entrance just staring at me. After college, I no longer party, and the lesson learned, never leave your drink unattended. This happened over 10 years ago, so excuse me if the details are a little fuzzy. When I was in high school, my friend Claire came to sleep over. We made some plans to sneak out and hang out with some guys, and then one of them would drive us home. We got to our friend's apartment, had some fun, and around midnight we decided it's time for us to head back. But when we asked to be taken back, everyone says no, despite previously agreeing to bring us back. Everyone said that they were too drunk or too high, so we eventually decided just to start walking back, and we would make some phone calls to see if anyone could pick us up and bring us the rest of the way back. My house was a good 20 minutes away by car on the highway, so there was no way we were walking all the way back. The apartment was towards the back of the complex, so we start making our way to the entrance. We don't even get halfway there before a car slowly starts rolling up behind us. I was 15 or 16 at the time and very naive to the ways of the world, so I wasn't too concerned. But Claire was a little smarter than me on this night. She tells me to start walking faster, so we start walking faster. The car also picks up their pace behind us. Again, she tells me to walk faster, so we start moving as fast as we can, and that's when the car pulled slightly in front of us and two of the passenger doors open and two men get out. Realizing that there's no walking faster to get out of this situation, she instructs me to run now. So she takes off running and I follow her. She runs towards a group of parked cars and jumps behind a pickup truck, and for a minute we hope and pray that we weren't spotted. This is where details get a little fuzzy. One of them must have gotten back in the car at some point as there's only one of them following us behind the truck. We hear a set of footsteps quickly approaching and she quietly indicates that we're now going into stealth mode. This man is on the other side of the truck that we're hiding behind. He's circling the truck looking for us. We're slowly and quietly circling it on the opposite side to avoid being spotted. It felt like a scene from a movie or a video game. We somehow managed to do two or three circles around the vehicle without being detected and by the grace of the gods, he gives up and decides to go back to the car with his friends. This is our one shot to get away. She tells me to run again, so we run for what felt like an eternity, but in reality it probably was only 15 to 20 seconds. We find the pool house area and we find a spot to hide. We were hidden behind some fences and bushes and were anxiously waiting to see if they discover us. Their car pulls around the pool house and we're biting our nails hoping that they don't stop and get out. The car slowly drives away and we realize that we haven't been spotted. We were safe for now. But the car circled around the apartment complex for hours and hours and hours. They were not giving up on looking for us. We were safe for the time being, but now we needed to find a way out of there. It was the middle of winter, 
and of course we were dressed to impress the guys that we went to hang out with, so short shorts and a little bit of revealing tops, and we were freezing. We found a dirty, disgusting Captain America blanket that we huddled up under while making phone calls to find someone to pick us up. We tried contacting the guys at the apartment, but no one answered our calls. None of our friends answered our calls. We felt completely alone and hopeless. But around 5 a.m., someone finally answered and said that they would pick us up. And this was the best news that I'd ever heard in my life at that point. Our friend gets to the apartment complex but can't find the pool house. The group of men is still constantly circling around, so there's no way we're coming out of hiding. We managed to figure out where our friend is at with a little detective work, figuring out what building they're facing, what's in front of them, and are there dumpsters nearby, etc., etc. We figure out where they're at, so we make a run for it. We spot their car and hop in as fast as we can. Go, 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 we tell them, and our friend speeds off towards the entrance. We pass the group of men on our way out, and that was the last we saw of them. We made it back at around 6 a.m., just in time to sneak back in without my parents ever knowing that we even left. If Claire hadn't been with me that night, I definitely would have been abducted, possibly killed, who knows. So thankful to Claire and our friend that picked us up, and a huge F you to the guys that intended to harm us that night. On a happier note, I'm now very diligent and aware of my surroundings, and we washed the dirty Captain America blanket and shared custody of it for years after this encounter. I was at Walmart earlier this evening with my two daughters, one elementary school aged and the other middle school aged, and we looked around the school supplies for a minute and then rounded the corner to see the Halloween candy on display. As we turned the corner, a slightly older guy came really close to us, like he was in a hurry, and almost ran into our cart. He didn't have a cart or any items at the time. I said, oh, excuse me and then stopped in front of the candy to let my youngest ask a bunch of questions about the candy pumpkins. The man stopped quickly and started rummaging around the candies right next to my daughter. He was listening to our conversation and reacted strangely when my daughter said she wanted to take a picture of the candy. He was twitchy and caught my eye and looked away quickly. We moved to the women's pajama section to look around for a few minutes and I noticed the same man pass by really close again. He was turning to the right toward the shoes with a big bag of candy cradled in his arms. My girls went across the aisle to the boys' clothing section while I finished deciding, and when I was catching up with them a couple of minutes later, that guy was winding through the boys' clothes towards my daughter's. He paused and looked confused or lost, but still he was in a rush and watched me discuss sizes with my youngest. This is when I started thinking something was off with this dude. I mentioned him to my older daughter and then we moved through the partition into the girl's clothes. I didn't see him again for a few minutes and I figured it was nothing, but then he came into that section and was acting like he was trying to pick out a justice shirt, which is kids clothing. He still had that big bag of candy that he kept adjusting his grip on. I kept seeing him take quick peeks at my girls, but then every time he saw me watching him, he pretended to be occupied with his shopping. I told my oldest that I thought he was following us, and she said she noticed the same thing. I made my youngest get into the cart so I could keep them both close. They both liked to wander a bit. The guy then walked out of the girl's section, passing close behind me, but he looped around the partition back into the boys' section and stopped at an opening on the other side, but still in a straight line of sight. He caught my eye again and twitched. Then he pulled out his phone, texted someone, and walked away. By that time, I was on high alert and possibly getting quite paranoid. I looked around and saw two other slightly older men kind of standing around. One was in electronics, sort of looking at a half-empty display of something, but I swear he glanced at me several times, even though there were three or four racks of clothes in a hallway with occasional people in between. The third guy had wandered into the girl's section and was apparently considering buying a Justice shirt too. Every time he saw me notice him watching us, he wandered down to the baby aisles, but he kept coming back after a couple of minutes. I realize now, looking back, that if I suspected something bad, 
I should have gotten my girls out of there. Clothes shopping for a picky preteen isn't fun, and I wanted to get it done and over with. On top of that, I kept second-guessing myself that the two other guys were just a coincidence. I kept my girls really close, and after we moved to the women's section, I didn't see any of them again, and I stopped feeling creeped out that we were being watched. Now it's the middle of the night, and I'm pretty freaked out, wondering what could have happened if I didn't notice that first guy and continued to let my girls wander around. Should I report anything? I can't imagine anything would be done just because I noticed some guy watching my daughters in Walmart, but I have heard those terrible stories of traffickers using Walmart to find their next victim. When I was a senior in college a few years ago, I lived in an old house about a five minute walk away from campus with five of my girlfriends. It was still COVID time so we spent a lot of time just in the house since we could not really go elsewhere. To preface, this house was old and many of the windows didn't lock. Our landlord sucked, as many college ones do, and didn't do anything to fix this issue, but with it being six of us and often a boyfriend or two sleeping in the house, it felt mostly safe and many of us would keep our windows open. Our college was in a town just outside of the second most dangerous city in the state, but right around the campus it felt relatively safe. When the weather started getting warmer in early spring, we would sit down on the roof to sunbathe and this roof faced our street. We would access the roof from my roommate's Mary's bedroom window on the second floor since it led straight to the roof. Our street was residential and didn't get a ton of traffic, but we did have a couple of encounters of younger guys catcalling us as they drove by, but nothing seemed sinister as we were college kids. One night, late in the semester, Mary went up to her room to call her brother while the rest of us were hanging downstairs and that's when she rushed downstairs and said that she saw a ladder leading up to the roof where we would all sunbathe and right near her window, which was open. Later, we learned that she said out loud to her brother what she saw before she came down. When she told us this, my other roommate and her boyfriend ran outside to find a man running away from our house with the freaking ladder, who we assume heard Mary telling her brother that she saw the ladder and knew that he was caught. It was dark, so they couldn't make out anything about him. I immediately texted her landlord asking if he had someone come by the house to do any work and he said no. We then called the police who came by. They did some investigating and patrolled our house for a couple of nights but we never found out who the man was, what his intentions were, or if he had been there before. So for context, I'm a 26 year old female and also live currently with another female roommate who hasn't been here a lot lately due to the fact that she's been staying at her boyfriend's house. We both have only been living here for half a year, about 6 months, so pretty good while but not years. I typically feel safe in this house but everything changed a few nights ago when I was there alone. The doors were locked, thank goodness, but I was in the kitchen. The window above our sink looks out into the back of our property where there are woods. We've never bothered to get a curtain for our kitchen window because there's nothing back there so it hasn't seemed like a priority. I was in the kitchen making some ramen on the stove which is right next to the sink when I heard something outside the window. I looked out and I saw a man standing there looking at me. He ran away obviously but I didn't know if he was trying to get in or what. I called the police and then my father. The police were very nice but since he was gone by the time they arrived they couldn't do much. I have cameras for the sides and the front of the house and they told me to get one for the back. If he comes back, they advise me to call them and they'll handle it. I'm not staying here anymore. I ordered a ring camera from Amazon, set it up and I've been watching the house from my family's place for a week. I don't know when I'll feel safe enough to return and I've just been feeling very scared. This is going to be a long one, and this is about weird encounters I've had with a music teacher when I was a kid. I, a 20-year-old female, took orchestra classes when I was in middle school. 
Now, it's important to mention that I was an incredibly quiet and shy kid back then and had trouble with confrontation. When I was in sixth grade, our orchestra teacher, Miss K, left the position and they rehired our new teacher. Our new teacher, I'll call him Mr. S, was generally disliked by everyone. He was in his 50s to early 60s and to an 11 year old, very tall. He was already imposing because of this, but what made it worse was how he treated his female students. One day in class, we were all struggling to play a song correctly. Mr. S became frustrated and didn't think any of us understood the beat of the song. He looked around the class, saying he needed a volunteer. Everyone became silent, including me, but I had the misfortune of locking eyes with him. He then called my name and waved me up to the front of the room. What happened next was not something anyone was expecting. I picked up my instrument, the cello, to take up front with me, and he said, No. Leave your instrument. Just you. I was really confused, but did as he said. I walked up to his side, and he instructed me to stand in front of him. At this point, the class was beginning to snicker, and I was just very uncomfortable. Move closer. I took a small step towards him, and at this point, I was too scared to look at his face. All I could see was his button t-shirt in front of me. He made me walk closer until I was inches from him. Then he moved my arm up and put my hand on his. He proceeded to make me slow dance with him for what felt like forever as he counted the beat. I let go of his hand at one point and tried walking back to my seat, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me back saying, not yet. After this was over and I went to my other classes, I learned that in each period of the day, he had chosen a female student to dance with him regardless if the class was struggling to understand the beat. Unfortunately, this was not the end of what felt like unwanted attention from him. He would somehow find me in the hallways and would try to have talks with me about anything, even though I mostly kept to myself and didn't cause trouble in class. I got to a point that my friends understood how I felt and knew to say something to me when they saw him, and every time, without fail, he always managed to put his hands on my shoulders when he talked to me, even if I was already backed against a wall. He wouldn't let me leave and I was too scared to say anything. He would find me in a crowd easily. He didn't do anything to my knowledge that was punishable, but to me, something always felt very off about him. Back in 2014, I was 18 years old and started my first real job at a call center. I worked the late shift, 3.30 p.m. to midnight. The call center floor was large, several hundred seats. I had a picture of my boyfriend, now husband, and I on my desk. Every night, I went out for a smoke break. The security guard, 35 to 40 year old male if I had to guess, would hit on me, comment on my appearance, and would suggest that we go out to dinner sometime. Multiple times I told him that I was engaged, I wasn't, and uninterested, and would flash off my senior ring which resembled an engagement ring and was strategically placed on my ring finger in an attempt to tell him to screw off. He would still make comments like, Oh, I'm sure your fiancé wouldn't mind. Overall, just very uncomfortable. This behavior spanned over a few weeks and I reported him to my management, and nothing ever came from it. Then one day I went to go out for my break and the security guard said, That's a nice picture. What? I replied. The picture of you and your fiance. <laughs> At this point, it dawned on me that he was talking about the picture on my desk. That creep walked through several hundred desks looking for mine and found it. What a weirdo. So basically we were crossing the border from Costa Rica to Nicaragua. The border has a long standing line where you wait to go through border control and there are a bunch of taxis on the other side. The line is long, my friend and I, both female, 23 years old at the time, were at the back of the line. This man comes up to us and is speaking Spanish. We don't understand but he guides us towards the front of the line and puts us next to two other American girls. We are confused and ask what's going on, but he says in broken English, You four together. I take you in taxi. 
We think it's weird, but we did skip some of the lines so we just stay next to the girls. We talk to them and we all agree that we think it's very strange that he put the only four young backpacking girls together when we clearly don't know each other and is aggressively making sure that we get in his taxi once we cross the border. Anyways, we cross the border and he's waiting for us. He begins leading us to his taxi. We tell him no and immediately jump into another taxi with two male backpackers that seem safe. As we look back, we see another guy yelling at the guy who was trying to get us to come with him. Now they're fighting, and he seems to maybe even hit him on the head for possibly not getting us in the car. Was this normal, or was he about to traffic all four of us? I started a new job this month, and my workplace is only two blocks away from the bus stop, with one of those blocks being a public sports place with a public pool and running tracks that I always go through instead of around because it's shorter and busier so I feel safe. However, the next block is quite lonely with not a lot of traffic from cars or people. This morning I was about to cross the street and an SUV stopped. I didn't find it weird because I thought the driver was being kind, letting me cross before continuing on their way. After that, I kept walking really slowly because I always make sure to arrive exactly on time and I was like five minutes early today. As I was about to turn right, I finally realized that the same SUV was a little bit in front of me, almost at my side, turning right really slowly. My workplace is surrounded by houses and a decent neighborhood, so when I saw him driving slowly, I just assumed that he was going to park in front of his house. However, he did stop, and I thought, oh well, maybe he has to open the porch, I don't know. But instead of getting out of the car, he just stayed there. That freaked me out, but I kept walking, like I said, really slowly. When I was about to be at the side of the car, I didn't know what to do. Should I run, walk normally until I pass him, or what? So I started walking more quickly, and when I was at the side of the car, he waved or did a sign at me, I don't know, I didn't catch it clearly. I ignored him and finally passed him, but once I did, he started the engine again, so he was right by my side. I finally arrived at my workplace, and he stopped again. I quickly rang the bell, and I can actually open the door from the outside, but I didn't want him to see how. Also, by ringing the bell, I was basically telling other people to come outside for me. Immediately after I rang the bell, he accelerated and left. I feel really bad for not trying to memorize his license plate or even remember his face, and I really hope no other girl has to go through this. Even if I had all of his information, I'm from a third world country, so the police probably wouldn't do anything about a potential creep. Last summer, I took two of my kids and two of my daughter's friends to a renaissance fair. As we were leaving, the girls, 15, 15, and 16, were walking ahead of us when I could see a man approach them and appear to ask to take their pictures. He had camera equipment, so my first thought was that he was with the fair, taking pictures to be sold. When I got up close to them, I realized that he didn't have an employee shirt or any indication of who he was. I stopped him from taking the picture and politely asked why he was taking a picture of my girls. Just one is mine, but he didn't need to know that. He had the gall and bristle to say, well, first of all, because they said I could, and turned his back to me. Well, it was the wrong thing to do. I stepped in front of him and said, absolutely not. You're not taking pictures of them. The girls were confused, and the dude tried to motion to them to step to the side. I raised my voice to make a scene and said, you are not taking photos of my girls. He asked which one was mine and I glared at him with my best teacher glare and said, All of them. He shook his head and started to walk off, then turned to hand two of them business cards and said to call him. I grabbed them out of his hands and told him to leave, and he stormed off. The cards had perforations on the edges and looked as though he'd made them at home. They advertised him as a modeling agent with a phone number. The kids wanted to know why I was being mean to him, they had also assumed that he was with the fair. After I explained that if he had been legit, 
He would have looked for a parent rather than avoiding one, and I explained what kind of modeling he may have had in mind. I could see it click with them, and they were completely creeped out. The audacity of this dude. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And super fun live streams are every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab the early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Look at it anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Buttersocks is the gift that keeps on giving.